It's a simple trick of video editing to make me materialise out of nowhere. And it's just as easy to make me disappear. Of course, you're not taken in by it. But what about so-called spirit materialisation? Dead people coming back to Earth from the other side. There are plenty of old photographs of mediums claiming to do this. But is it just a hoax? If true, what excellent evidence there would be for surviving bodily death. So I'm going to take a look at this old material. Over the years, quite a few physical mediums were investigated by scientists, whereas today there are relatively few such mediums. And as their phenomena occur almost exclusively in the dark, modern mediums are of limited value in discussing this subject. The sceptics controlling the pages of Wikipedia have condemned the phenomena as just so much rubbish. They say the scientists of the past were duped by fraudulent mediums, that they had neither the observational nor the analytical skills needed to detect charlatans. If you believe the sceptics, not only the investigators, but also the mediums and the phenomena can all simply be ignored. But I disagree. Having seen the evidence, you can choose between my findings and the sceptics' beliefs. Let's take the scientists first. All eminent in their fields, some of the finest scientific minds of all time, and worthy of considerable respect. So here's a list of the people who investigated spirit materialisation. Sir William Crookes was knighted for his contribution to science. He discovered the element thallium and the first sample of helium. He investigated cathode rays and vacuum tubes. A brilliant experimenter, he won three Royal Society medals. He became a president of the Royal Society and the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr Charles Richet was a French physiologist who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1913. He became director of the International Metapsychic Institute in Paris. He was president of the British Society for Psychical Research. In addition to studying mediums, he wrote an important book entitled 30 Years of Psychical Research. And he invented the word ectoplasm, a subject we'll look at later. Dr Gustav Gelly spent many years studying physical mediums and he wrote several books. His most famous one, From the Unconscious to the Conscious, was published in 1921 and translated into English. He was a French physician who also became director of the International Metapsychic Institute in Paris. Professor Albert von schrenk notzing was a German physician and a psychiatrist. A notable psychical researcher, his most famous book, over 600 pages long, was The Phenomena of Materialization. Dr César Lombroso, an Italian, was Professor of Psychiatry and Forensic Medicine. He was best known as the Father of Criminology. Now, have you spotted any second-rate scientists yet? I haven't, but in Wikipedia, these eminent scientists, who spent years developing their expertise, are denigrated as the gullible dupes of fraudulent mediums. Some are even described as unscientific. But let's continue, since the list of these top-notch people is not exhausted. Pierre and Marie Curie were a married couple with three Nobel Prizes between them. Most famous for their research in radioactivity, the Curies viewed seances as scientific experiments, and they took detailed notes at 43 sittings. Pierre Curie won his Nobel Prize for physics in 1903, being a pioneer in magnetism, piezoelectricity, crystallography and radioactivity. He is reported as saying, it was very interesting, and the phenomena we saw appeared inexplicable as trickery. Tables raised from all four legs, movement of objects from a distance, hands that pinch or caress you, luminous apparitions, with a small number of spectators all known to us, and without a possible accomplice. How do you explain the phenomena when one is holding the medium's hands and feet and when the light is sufficient so that one can see everything that happens? 
Marie Curie won her two Nobel Prizes in chemistry and physics and discovered two new elements, polonium and radium. And she worked on isolating radioactive isotopes. Dr. Paul Gibier was a French researcher in contagious diseases. He founded the New York Pasteur Institute, which provided the foundation for the modern biomedical industry. And he received the Légion d'honneur. He published five books on psychical matters, two on materialization, and established the reality of surprising phenomena. He wanted to bring his medium, Mrs. Salmon, to Europe, but a fatal accident cut short his life. Dr. Julian Ochorovitz was a researcher in psychology, hypnosis and telepathy who also investigated several mediums. A philosopher and a poet, he was also a scientist, developing the telephone and early ideas on radio and television transmission. Albert de Rocha was a scholar in maths and literature and also became a military engineer. A lieutenant colonel awarded the acclaimed Légion d'honneur. He was a respected researcher into the scientific basis for psychic phenomena. A prolific author writing 14 books on parapsychology and many more on engineering subjects. Johann Zollner was a German professor of astrophysics at Leipzig University, a well-known psychical researcher and author of the book Transcendental Physics. He concluded that a four-dimensional space may explain spiritualism. He became embroiled in a great deal of controversy with sceptics, but he aggressively defended his views. Sir Oliver Lodge was a British physicist and engineer, the first principal of Birmingham University, and a fellow of the Royal Society, and one time president of the British Association. He researched electromagnetism and was a key developer of radio and the petrol engine spark plug. His contribution to psychical research was significant since he wrote 40 books on the subject and was something of a genius. Dr. Enrico Morselli was Professor of Psychiatry at Turin and Genoa Universities and a researcher into mental illness and suicide. President of the Italian Society for Neurology and Psychiatry, he was also interested in mediumship and psychical research. And then there's Dr. W. J. Crawford from New Zealand. He gained his doctorate from Glasgow University and he lectured in mechanical engineering at the Technical Institute and the Queen's University in Belfast. For six years he studied in detail the Golliger family, especially the physical mediumship of Kathleen Golliger. Although very poor, this family didn't accept any payment for their efforts, and the result was three important books on physical mediumship. Sir William Barrett was Professor of Experimental Physics at the Royal College of Science in Dublin, discovering a silicon iron alloy used in electrical engineering. Elected a fellow of the Royal Societies of Dublin, Edinburgh and London, he helped found the Society for Psychical Research and published five books on the subject. He also approved the research of Dr Crawford. Alexander Aksakov was a Russian writer, editor and psychical researcher. A member of His Imperial Majesty's Chancellery, he was titled Your Excellency. He coined the term telekinesis, and his research resulted in a major work, Animism and Spiritism. In the late 1860s, Aksakov became an organiser of the first seances in Russia. There are other researchers worth mentioning, but not enough space to do them justice. Believe me, the people I've reviewed here were not idiots. Far from it, that should be self-evident. Yet most have been criticised by commentators thinking they know better. Before we continue, I think it'd be a good idea to clarify the different kinds of mediumship. In mental mediumship, the common kind seen today, the medium is in mental contact with afterlife spirits giving messages to their loved ones. Often these messages have been shown to be correct. In physical mediumship, loud raps may be heard coming from anywhere in the seance room. Objects may move without human contact. Tables and chairs levitate themselves off the floor 
and small lights may swirl around the room. The voice trumpet floats around touching the sitters and sometimes voices come through the trumpet independently. Musical instruments may play themselves unaided and sometimes small objects called apports appear in the seance room as gifts for the participants. Now materialization is one aspect of physical mediumship that not all mediums can achieve. It requires a trance state and producing apparently from nowhere hands that touch the participants, a head only may appear, or the upper part of a torso. Sometimes these beings are luminous. At the extreme, entire spirit people are produced, dressed in clothes who can walk, talk, and seem entirely human. Now that sounds crazy. These hands or spirit people ultimately dissolve and have been witnessed many times, simply sinking into the floor. I know that sounds not quite right and very hard to believe. Accepting it means that the nature of reality changes too, and that's a step too far for many people. But let's look at the mediums that the scientists worked with. One of the first on the scene was a star indeed, if you can accept the evidence of Sir William Crookes. He started out intending to disprove this spiritualistic nonsense through his own research. But after months of empirical work, he changed his mind. So meet Florence Cook. Most materialization mediums produce their results in the dark, which makes belief in them difficult. But not this teenage medium. She would go behind a curtain to raise what the seance participants called the power and before long a different person would emerge into the room. In this case, a woman called Katie King, who claimed to be the daughter of an 18th century pirate called John King. Yes, John King really existed, and he died in a storm off Cape Cod in 1717. Controversy raged about whether Katie King was simply the medium in disguise. And Crooks checked this out. He noted their differences, that Katie was taller and heavier, the moulds on their skin differed, and only one had pierced ears. And he photographed them together to rule out impersonation. He discovered Katie had a pulse which a doctor actually measured. And this has been found in other materialization cases too. One sitter, the prolific writer Florence Marriott, author of There Is No Death, witnessed Katie without clothes to check that she really was a woman, and she watched as Katie dissolved, sank into the floor and disappeared. Sir William also investigated the famous Scottish medium Daniel Dunglass Hume, who could make an accordion play itself untouched. He could vary the weight of a plank of wood hooked up to a recording device simply by wishing it to be lighter or heavier, and he could also levitate himself. Crookes was ridiculed by other scientists for his investigations, but he resolutely stood by his results until his death in 1919. Well now, I can't offer this much detail for all the mediums in a program of this length. So here's a quick review of the other mediums the scientists examined. In France, Eva Carrier was studied by Dr. Gelly, Dr. Richet, and Professor von schrenk notzing who also investigated the Polish medium Stanislava P. From Italy, Eusapia Palladino spent much of her life being tested by many scientists, including Dr. Richet, Ochorowicz, Lodge, the Curies, and Lombroso. From England, Elizabeth Hope, known as Madame d'Espérance, was a subject for Alexander Aksakov in Russia. In Ireland, Kathleen Golliger, as we've said, worked with Dr. Crawford. In the USA, Mina Crandon, known as Marjorie, was investigated by several professors, including three from the American Society for Psychical Research. The magician Houdini called her a fraud, but he's since been reported at a seance apologising for his vitriol. 
The English medium, Minnie Harrison, after the Second World War, held private home circles for many years. Although not officially examined by scientists, a respected surgeon, William Jones, FRCS, took infrared photographs of fully materialised spirits in Minnie's circle. And finally, there's Helen Duncan, the most controversial materialisation medium of all time, not least because she was the last person in England to be imprisoned under the Witchcraft Act of 1735 for her mediumship. And there are more, of course. From London, the controversial figure of William Eglinton. From Wales, Jack Webber, an ex-miner from a Christian family, seen here in trance and levitating a 20 kilo table. Also, Alec Harris from Wales, who lived for a long time in South Africa. From Poland, Franek Kluski, of whom more later. From Iceland, Indridi Indridason, about whom a book was recently published. And from Brazil, the remarkable Carlos Mirabelli. Another materialization medium was Ethel Post Parrish, an American. Now, take a look at this. In Pennsylvania in 1953, these photographs were taken at 50 second intervals with an infrared camera at a seance attended by 81 people. They show the materialization of a so-called Indian spirit guide called Silver Bell. You can see Ethel Post Parrish sitting behind her curtain, while just outside the spirit form materializes. The seance report says some of the attendees walked arm in arm with Silver Bell. Nonetheless, in these photographs, she looks like a cardboard cutout figure and therefore neither properly human nor properly spirit-like. And this is not the only cardboard cutout appearance of a so-called materialized spirit created by these mediums, of which there are actually abundant photographs. In a book entitled Other Realities by Zofia Weaver, which summarizes the mediumship of the Polish medium, Franek Kluski, there's a possible explanation for cardboard type spirit figures. On page 53 of the book, it says, during the period of Kluski's mediumship, there were many partial materializations, unfinished busts, hands with missing fingers, as well as apparitions which looked as if they'd been made from cardboard or rags. The rarest materializations were those that were smaller or larger than normal. The artificial looking phantoms were preceded by sounds like the rubbing of cardboard or fabric and the tearing of paper, but no trace was ever found of such objects afterwards. Now on page 59 the book says the second group of phantoms was characterized by the perfection of their materializations, which at the time made them indistinguishable from living humans, as well as by their ability to maintain that state of full materialization for quite a long time. These figures would be constantly visible by illuminating themselves with a light much stronger than the light of the phosphorescent screen in the room. Their behaviour was always very dignified and solemn, and the participants either dared not or could not treat them as the phantoms described earlier. Frequently, they would react accurately to thoughts before the individual had a chance to articulate them. Now, this is in contrast to some of the phantoms illuminated only by the phosphorescent screen, which appeared not to realise that they existed and seemed to seek support, help or information from the participants. I'd just like to add that this book is really impressive as a summary of the original investigator's findings. It has a lot more to impart and I recommend it as a first class read. So now let's examine the phenomena themselves. I won't mention the medium's name each time I show you a photograph, but take a look at these. First off, there are several examples showing a seance trumpet being held aloft by the medium's ectoplasm, the stuff used in materialization. 
Then there are photographs of spirit materializations themselves. As I said earlier, these may seem neither convincing nor authentic when they look like drawings or cutouts. But are they really fraudulent and should we jump to conclusions? Then there are so-called permanent paranormal objects. These plaster hands are made from wax moulds taken from alleged materialised spirits. It's said that the interleaving of fingers makes it impossible for the hands to have been withdrawn from the delicate paraffin wax coating unless the hands that made them were dematerialised. In 1997, two researchers, Polidoro and Gala Shelley, challenge this with their own experiment to prove fraud. But they fail to mention that in the original experiments, identifier staining chemicals were secretly added to the paraffin prior to the seances, and that these stains were identified in the final wax moulds and not found on any of the participants. So now to the crunch question. Is ectoplasm real? The sceptics say that it's not, and this makes all the mediums and all the scientific researchers either deluded or liars, with the phenomena themselves only trickery. The sceptics say that ectoplasm is simply cheesecloth, muslin, or sometimes papier-mâché stolen into the séance room. I'm not saying that ectoplasm has not been faked, and there have been plenty of examples of apparent fakery. But has every instance been faked? As the famous Harvard professor William James said, in order to prove that all crows are not black, it's necessary only to find one white crow. And that's the case here. Just one true example of materialization wins the case. These are photographs of ectoplasm exuding from mediums in trance. Ask yourself whether every single case looks like muslin or cheesecloth. Well, some of them do, but others do not. Ectoplasm is reported to smell unpleasantly of ozone. It's defined as a mystical material flowing out of any orifice in the medium's body during a seance, usually off-white, but also it could be black or grey. It's a solid or a vapour that transforms itself into materialised limbs, faces, and even the entire bodies of spirits. Its structure is said to vary from clouds and veils to membranes and thin psychic rods. Exposed to light, it's said to disappear, snapping back quickly into the medium, possibly injuring them, and that's why it's regarded as dangerous. There have been several cases of this, and Helen Duncan's death was blamed on just such an event when the police abruptly raided one of her seances. The renowned 18th century scientist and mystic Emanuel Swedenborg referred to, and I quote, a kind of vapour streaming from the pores of my body. The medium, Elizabeth Desperance, said, My first impression is of being covered with spider webs. The air is filled with a substance like the steam from a locomotive formed in front of the abdomen. I could feel fine threads being drawn out of the pores of my skin. So Arthur Conan Doyle was not only the author of Sherlock Holmes, but also a qualified physician. And he spoke of squeezing a sample of ectoplasm produced by the medium Eva C. He saw it as a living substance responding and shrinking to his touch. Ectoplasm has been described as sometimes moist and cold, sometimes viscous and sticky, and more rarely dry and hard, and its production could affect the temperature in the room. Working with the medium Kathleen Golliger, Dr Crawford traced the flow of ectoplasm using natural colouring to stain it, carmine powder, and he found the ectoplasm stained various parts of Miss Golliger's body. On staining her blouse with the colouring and asking for a wrap on the wall, 
Crawford found carmine spots at the location of the wraps. In Boston, USA, Mina Crandon was photographed reabsorbing ectoplasm through the mouth, nose and ears. And her husband, Dr. Crandon, who was a surgeon, described it as being ice cold, rough on the surface and yielding slightly like a rubber eraser might do. In 1916, Baron von schrenk notzing received ectoplasm from a medium Stanislav B to obtain a bacteriological report. He found albumin matter with leukocytes and epithelial cells, but starch and sugar were absent. Searching the internet, I found this chemical structure for ectoplasm, but I don't know where it came from and I can't vouch for it. But returning to Dr. Crawford's research, he theorised that the citizen a seance also contribute to the ectoplasmic flow. By putting them all on scales, he discovered that their weight could vary during a seance by losing 10 to 15 pounds. In one case, the 128 pound medium lost half her weight. Other mediums were then tested and Charles William shrank from 153 pounds to only 35. Annie Mellon and a Miss Wood both lost half their weight. On one occasion, the researcher Dr. Julian Achorovitz noted how the medium Eusapia Palladino was, and I quote, all shrunken together. And Dr. Vetsano also noticed Eusapia's lower limbs actually disappear. And this partial dematerialization has also been observed in other mediums, including Elizabeth Desperance, the Brazilian Carlos Mirabelli, and the Icelandic medium Indridi Indridison. Materialization photos such as these from Dr. van der Sand's book invite us to look further at the relationship between ectoplasm and materialization. But this is where it starts to get purely theoretical since we have to rely on anecdotes from spirits themselves. In the first place, they have to recall what they looked like while they were living on Earth. Then we're told that spirit scientists get them to project this self-image into the ectoplasm and get covered in ectoplasmic substance. But those born before photography existed may not remember what they looked like in life. One spirit informed Dr. Richet that since he could not remember, he could not materialise at all. And when an old friend of Florence Marriott's materialised but didn't look like she expected, he said he would practice and do better next time, which he did. So spirit appearances are malleable, and this may explain why Silver Bell looked so fake. Was her self-image based simply on her reflection in a pool? In any case, producing ectoplasm is not the end in itself, only the means to producing materializations. And if the power in the seance is not good enough, the result may only be partial, or even that familiar cardboard cutout appearance. Dr. Thomas Glenn Denning Hamilton was a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and one time president of both the Manitoba and the Canadian Medical Associations. He was for years a serious researcher in these phenomena and convinced of the reality of materialization. Perhaps I should have mentioned him earlier, it's indeed. Wikipedia's report on him is actually not that denigrating, apart from the claim that his photographs are fake, especially this one showing the head of Arthur Conan Doyle, which they say is made of tissue paper and photographs. The idea that every medium was exposed as a hoaxer is simply not true. Many were studied under controlled conditions, binding them to a chair, gagging them, having them sit with their hands inside secure net bags so they couldn't be fraudulent, or even entirely inside a bag tied up at the neck, and even having all their orifices inspected before the seance began. On one occasion in Paris, Franek Plusky sat with no clothes on at all. Dr. Gelly described a dimly phosphorescent column forming beside him on one occasion, out of which a luminous hand perfectly formed, appeared and patted him on the forearm in a friendly way. At present, this is surely beyond our understanding. 
Indeed, the man who invented the word ectoplasm, Nobel Prize winner Dr. Charles Richet, said of these phenomena, I never said it was possible, I only said it was true. My own conclusion is that many of these phenomena definitely look faked. But to assume that this is the only possible conclusion amounts to what we might call throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Thank you for listening.